Father God, we thank you that your word is true and real. We thank you, God, that it's wisdom. We thank you that it's strength. We thank you that your word is everything that we need. And God, today we ask you to pour your word out upon our weaknesses. Show us the founding fathers of our faith. And take us to places on the water that we want to go, God. Places that we've been afraid of up till now. Help us, God. We need you. Otherwise, we're doing nothing here. Holy Spirit, we invite you to have your way in us and through us for the glory and furtherance of the kingdom by the power of our King's blood, Jesus, we pray. Amen. You put that up, would you please? Today we're looking at Hebrews chapter 11. Some people call it the hall of faith. Faith. Some definitions of faith. Strong belief or trust in someone or something. Belief in the existence of God. Strong religious feelings or beliefs. A system of religious beliefs. Plural faiths. Allegiance to a duty or person. Loyalty, fidelity to one's promises. Sincerity of intentions. Belief and trust in and loyalty to God. Belief in the traditional doctrines of religion. Firm belief in something for which there is no proof. Complete trust. Something that is believed, especially with strong conviction, especially a system of religious beliefs, like the Protestant faith, which is... Today, looking at faith, I want to explain to you a little bit what faith is. Everything that we do in this world requires faith. Everything that we do in, in, our, in our life, with or without God, requires faith. Here's the difference. The less faith you have in the world, the smarter you are. The more you're rewarded for your diligence. The more you're rewarded for your intelligence. The more you're rewarded for your faithfulness. Yet in Christianity, in God's eyes, the more faith you have in that which has no proof, that which has no evidence, that which has no substance, the more you're rewarded by God. It's kind of a crazy thing. World's upside down, world's backwards, we know that, but you guys have heard me use the example of a chair. You guys came in here and you sat in a chair. Did you check it first? Did you make sure? Don't play no joke on me. You went to sit down, made sure nobody was standing back. You're going to snatch that chair out from under you. You sat down in that chair with faith. Listen, scientists, especially in this world, big debate right now is all that evolution. Evolution takes more faith than creation. For I have seen God change lives. I'm proof of that. But I've never seen one species change to another. The Bible says that all animals were made in their kind. Dog never turned into a cat. Fish never turned into a hamster. Never. There's no proof of it. Zero. There's no missing link. But over billions and billions of years, things have evolved. You believe that? More power to you. It's a tough pill for me because I'm a man of faith, I believe. Crazy. Genesis chapter 1 says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. I believe it. Call me crazy, call me silly. Do you want to put that shirt on? Or you just want to wear it? Or do you want me to hold it? Because I'll do either for you, because I love you, buddy. Now it's on backwards, so I know it's only going to be about three or four minutes and it's going to come off. Atta boy. Faith. If you are a gunsmith, gun, if you're a gun person, you put these little shells in your 
gun and you aim it and when you pull the trigger, you're hoping in faith that whoever made that bullet <laughs> put just the right amount of powder in it, sealed that thing properly, hoping that the pin fires properly. Faith. You understand? Am I making any connection? Faith. When we pray, we're praying to something we can't see, voice we've never heard audibly, and we're asking God to do something that we hope he's going to do, knowing that the vast majority of the time, he doesn't do what we ask, but we hope in our faith. I don't know how the world gets by. When it comes to marriage, I have faith that my wife, when I go to work, doesn't have a boyfriend or something come over the house. Ladies giggle at stuff like that. Men don't. Men are like, darn straight. I got a security system. What do you think I got so many kids for? They'll rat her out. <laughs> I mean, they better rat her out. They rat me out all the time. <laughs> Without faith, what exists? Fear. Doubt. Worry. Faith in God removes every existence of pain that your life will throw at you. I dive into faith now, being rewarded by God for the littlest of faith that I've had. I dive in now, head first, sink into the depths of the cobalt blue ocean that is faith. When health fails, when relationship breaks down, when money stops coming in. I don't fret, I don't fear, I don't worry, I don't manipulate, I dive into faith. I say, God, look at my faith. I believe, and then I search my brain, I search the pages of scripture for a verse that will, there's a great verse in Micah. Every once in a while, one of the fighters at the gym will lose, and they've worked so hard. Imagine training two or three months every single day, four or five hours a day, working on your jiu-jitsu, working on your striking, training, getting, just bringing your body to the edge of exhaustion and pain every single day. And then fight night comes and something happens where, for whatever reason, you lose. You didn't lose to a better fighter. Maybe you got caught. Maybe you made a mistake. There's a verse that says, Do not rejoice over me, mine enemy, for though I have fallen, I will rise up. Though I sit in darkness, I shall see light again. When you've had a defeat in your life and somebody gives you something like that, is it just an encouraging word? Is it just something that, yeah, that's cool, I like that, you know, Confucius says or whatever. No. The Bible has 3,000 promises about your life. And this Bible, this book has never failed. I hold it, and I read it, and I teach it so tight and so dear because I've seen God do the miraculous. I've told this story, and looking to the eyes of my daughter, I want to tell it again because it was a, it was a story of faith. You guys have been around of our church for more than a few months. You've heard this story. So I apologize in advance that you heard this story again. But for me, it's a testimony. For me, it's the power of God. It was 1994. Federal agents had seized my business. I had imported some, something from Africa that didn't have the proper paperwork. Although what I had imported was legal, the paperwork was forged in the country of origin. Federal government told me that I was looking at five to ten years because of my past history when I was living in New York. And I was like, holy crap. 
I got a family now. I'm not a kid anymore. I can't do a five-year bid now. And I started going to church. And somebody said to me, you know, the book of Romans in 828 says, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. And I said, whoopee. And he said to me, Ryan, if you believe in faith, this will be the greatest thing that's ever happened to your life, if you believe. I couldn't see it. I remember thinking to myself, it was like looking down a tunnel, and all it was was black. I saw no light. Well, God arranged a bunch of different situations, circumstances, lawyers, plea agreements, bargains, deals, stuff that I never had a say so in. I didn't have to testify against anybody else because I just didn't think that was right, being Sicilian, to tell what somebody else did to make myself feel better. So I wound up doing a year and a day in federal prison. And the day I reported, there I was, walking into that first black hole. And something was different about it this time, guys. Something was different. I had done plenty of time before this. When I was in New York, Rikers Island, no big deal. 106th Precinct, no big deal. I got all that stuff. That was no big deal. Something about this now is that I had a wife and three children at home. I had a business. And now my decisions didn't just hurt me. I had a daughter. Well, I still got her, but she was really little back then. And she used to say to me, I can't go to sleep without my daddy. So 9 o'clock would roll around, Daddy, Daddy, go to sleep. Lay down with me. Go to sleep. Her older sister, a couple years older than her, would always steal her milk. <laughs> tell her to go, go get some more milk. Can you lay down with me for a couple minutes? Couple minutes. Couple minutes. Okay, just a couple minutes though. I'd go in the room, and we'd spoon. I'd try not to fall asleep because then it'd be 2 o'clock in the morning and I'd be crawling upstairs, wife wondering where I went. Every few minutes, I'd, she's awake. Get up out of bed halfway. Where are you going? Nowhere. Nowhere. <laughs> Eventually, she'd fall asleep, and that was our nightly routine. Well, it was about four or five months into my prison sentence, and I was talking to my wife on the phone, and when you're in prison, you get certain times where you can use the phone, and I'd call my wife every day, sometimes two or three times a day, what's going on, how's it going, bills due, uh, borrowed more money from my in-laws, rent's three months, uh, mortgage is three months behind, rent on the store is five months behind, it's like, <sighs> car's breaking down, she comes to see me, she puts the kids in the car, it's like, but there was a light, and the light was Romans 8.28. All things work together for good. You got to believe. You got to believe. I called my house. My wife says, Ashlyn wants to talk to you. And I said, hi, baby. And she said, Daddy, I don't like this school anymore. We told her I was going to school. <laughs> Yale, jail, same thing, right? <laughs> it's close. <laughs> I want you to come home. I want you to come lay down with me, just for a couple minutes. No, it's just like a dagger in your heart. Just, not just a dagger, just a dagger in the pull. Mm. I can't. I can't leave here. Please, Daddy, I don't like this school. I miss you. I can't sleep. You know, blah, blah, blah. I felt like I was in a, a Pink Floyd movie. I just kind of slid down the wall, you know, the, the white 
brick wall and just slid and just let the phone just kind of roll back and forth listening to her voice. I can't come home. So you really did it this time, Ryan, didn't you? Not just hurting yourself, now you're hurting other people. Now you're hurting your kids. I heard my wife's voice, honey, I'm sorry, I didn't know she was going to do that. It's killed me. It's like, all right, I'll, I'll talk to you in the morning. It was, it, was her, it was night, she was going to bed. And just went back to my bunk, laid down, anger and frustration and, you promised me! Everything's going to work out great, right? The light at the end of the tunnel. All things work together for good. Well, it was a long night of sleep. Woke up the next morning. You learn how to suck it up in prison. You got to be a man. You can't, you know, you want to do the crime? You got to do the time. Get on the phone, call my wife about 9 o'clock. She goes, you have got to talk to Ashlyn. And I said, I can't do that again. This is not the place to walk around with the kind of frustration and anger. So she grabs the phone. I said, good morning, baby. She goes, oh, daddy, I had a dream last night that God put you in bed with me, and it was just like you were there for a couple of minutes. <laughs> he makes a way. He makes a way when you find no way. He makes a way when you don't think it's possible. The more you go out beyond what you think can be done logically, what you can't afford, what you don't have, the more you go out there, the more you're rewarded by God. Even when your faith is weak, God still rewards. There's a story in the Bible. God brings his kid to the apostles, brings, brings him to the church. Yeah, fix my kid. I spent 20 years screwing him up. You fix him now. And the church can't do nothing for you. And the apostles, they said, Lord Jesus, we, we can't do nothing. And he casts the demon out. He grabs the guy and he says, do you believe He says, well, I brought, I brought my kid to your, to your disciples. They couldn't do nothing. I brought him to the church. Nothing happened. Did you bring him to Jesus? Did you just bring him to church? He looked at the Lord and he said, I believe. Help my unbelief. That's real faith. Faith that doubts sincerely. Faith that doubts in reality, not skeptical, not scoffing. God, I want to believe, but I've seen such horrible things. If you're in law enforcement here, if you're, if you're one of the Marines or soldiers or, or airmen or seamen that are, that are in a part of our church, you've seen things. You've seen the side of human life that you go, you don't know what you're talking about. I've seen stuff. I know. You have, and you've done stuff. You believe, and God forgives. You believe that somehow God is a God of justice and equity, that it all balances in the kingdom. Nobody gets one over on God. Nobody. Remember that old uh, little rascal saying, you could fool some of the people some of the time? You could fool all the people some of the time. You could fool some of the people some of the time. But you can't fool mom. <laughs> you can't fool God. Don't be deceived. God's not mocked. What a man sows, this too he shall reap. With all these things in mind, please turn for faith. The hall of faith is listed men and women of faith. I will read it to you comment a little bit, we'll run right through it. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. <laughs> that's, a, 
That's a great description of faith. There it is right there. Faith is the substance of things hoped. What's faith? Believing in what you hope for. It's the very substance of hoping for things. Now, you're here, and some of you guys are here for different reasons. Now, I came to God because I wanted him to get me out of a prison sentence that I knew I wasn't going to be able to get out of. I believed in God, but I really didn't believe in God. <laughs> There's one of those situations where you, they call it fire insurance, you know what I mean? The evidence of things you don't see, for by it the elders obtained a good testimony. What's the testimony? By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. It takes faith to believe that God said, let there be light, and boom, there was light. It takes faith. Now, does anybody doubt that you see light? Of course not. There's light. But do you doubt that you see it? Don't doubt that I see it. I just don't know where it came from. Well, I can't tell you how they make light bulbs. Light bulbs flip me out. Wait a second. You can't open them up because if you open them up, they explode, but yet there's gas in there. Well, how do they seal that thing? It, I don't understand. But I know that they exist. Oh, yeah, but that's easy. Man made a light bulb. I mean, there's machines that make light bulb. It goes all the way up the line. You ask an evolutionist, where did it all come from? You know what they'll tell you? We don't know yet, but science will find it. That's what they'll tell you. So you have faith that there originally was a big ball. First there was nothing, then there was something, then something that was nothing blew up. That's right. And you say what I believe is faithful. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of the things which are visible. By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it, being dead, he still speaks. You guys know the story of Cain and Abel? All the way back in the book of Genesis? Abel brought a blood sacrifice to God and said, God, this is for you. This is from my heart. This is from my love. By faith, accept it. And God accepted it. And his brother Cain was so mad at him that he killed him. But here he says that his testimony of faith still exists today. 1 John 1, 9 says this. If you confess your sins that he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness, the vast majority of people, especially if you're new to God, new to church, new to this situation, you believe that this whole thing's real but you don't believe that God will forgive you. I know that was me. God won't forgive me for what I've done. I had done some horrible things in my old neighborhood. Horrible. Atrocious. And I didn't believe that God would forgive me. Do you believe that the Word of God says if you confess your sins, He is faithful? Then it does not matter what you've done, who you've done it to, where you've done it. God can forgive you. You got to believe. If God can forgive you, you got to forgive yourself too. That's one of the hardest things. Verse 5 By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Enoch. It's a little story in the book of Genesis talking about genealogy. Enoch's an amazing character. When men were living 900 years, after 300 years, God looked at Enoch and said, you know, I like you. I'm taking you now. Enoch's one of the only two other people in the Bible that never died. Enoch never died. Enoch was a picture of what we call the rapture. Do you believe in the rapture? I do. I believe at any given time, at any given moment, the Lord Jesus could come back to earth. The first time coming as a baby, the second time as a conquering king. He looks down from heaven. He knows those who are his. And like you ever send a text on, a, on an iPhone? That's the noise. They nailed it. I believe that. 
And I can't wait. And I hope I don't screw up real bad till then. He comments on faith in verse 6. He says, but without faith it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That's what I was talking about. Guys, the further out you go in faith, the more you're rewarded. To believe beyond what you understand, to believe. Well, let's see. I believe in that chair because I sat down and it kept me straight. Hi, how are you? Just saying hi. I'm allowed to say hi, aren't I? If you believe in what you don't see, because the Word of God promises it, oh, the reward is great. Pleasing God. Who wants to please God? Anybody want to please God? I want to please God. Well, here you have the recipe. If you want to please God, believe. Believe. Stay with me. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness, which is according to faith. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, that's some pretty big faith. I want you to know Noah lived in a time when there was no such thing as rain. Men were living 900 to 1,000 years. And some of you guys even now, you're like, well, that's why I don't believe in the Bible. Who lives 1,000 years? Well, listen to me. Do you guys know why things age? Do you know the earth is being bombarded by protons from space, which causes things to age? And do you know at one time there was a crust, a core that surrounded a big crust surrounding all the earth? No protons, no neutrons, not even croutons got through. <laughs> I'm struggling with that one too. It's okay, that takes a little bit of faith. And here God spoke to a man's heart and said, I want you to build an ark, a big boat. Huh? Well, because I'm going to make it rain. What's rain, God? You'll see. Almost crazy, like somebody taking some criminal out of a prison cell and saying, hey, I want you to go start a church. <laughs> no, you got the wrong guy, God. No, I got the right guy. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place that he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs of him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Suvopi, yeah. where did you grow up? Germany. Yeah. What the heck are you doing in Romania? New Jersey people don't go to Romania. What are you doing in Romania? Why don't you find yourself a nice man, get married, settle down, have a bunch of kids, you know, relax. Some people just are crazy. They hear the voice of the Lord, and they move all over the world looking for something and they sacrifice a home. She doesn't have a home. Her home is wherever God tells her to go because she believes what Abraham believed. I have a better home. There's an old story. I love this story. It always sits so securely in my heart about these two missionaries. They were, they were traveling back to their original church. They were in the mission field for about 20 years. And it just so happened that the same time they were flying into, um, at the same time they were flying into uh, the airport, there was a couple of ambassadors from the government flying in at the same time. And they had noticed, well, here are these people serving the Lord for 20 plus years. And they got to the airport and there was nobody there. They had to get a cab to get home. And the husband looking a little 
feeling, I guess, a little sorry for himself. He looked at the ambassador's welcome and the news was there and the people were shouting, here they were. And he looked at his wife and said, it's kind of funny, isn't it? Here we are serving God and when we come home, nobody. When they come home, look at all the people. And his wife, she reached over and touched his arm and said, honey, we're not home yet. <coughs> do you believe that, Sue? I do too. I believe in you. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore from one man, and him as good as dead, were born as many as the stars of the sky and multitude innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. Here's this woman, 90 years old, her husband's close to 100. God tells this man, from you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. I will make you and your descendants as numerable as the sand. <laughs> she had to remind God, uh, excuse me, I'm 90 years old. And my husband, we used to have a saying in New York, dead as Kelsey's. That's what he was. Guess what? Guess what? We are all descendants of Abraham. Through his faith, he is the father of the faithful. And his descendants, the nation of the Jews, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, go down to the 12 tribes. If you are Jewish, you know who your father is, Abraham. From a 100-year-old guy and a 90-year-old wife? Listen, in our church, we have seen women who could not conceive, conceive. We've watched women who've called upon the Lord Doctors said it ain't going to happen, can happen. We've watched God do it. And let me tell you what else we've watched. We've watched women who could not have children adopt kids and find the love that they have for their adopted daughter exceeds anything, anything, any woman who gave birth to a son or daughter could have. Faith. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly they seek a homeland, and truly if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country, Therefore, God's not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. There are some, like Sue, like certain hearts of missionaries, they hold nothing for themselves. Zero. You guys have heard me say, I tell my kids all the time, don't plan on inheritance. You ain't going to get none. I'm giving it all away. Get a job and work, because if there's anything left, I'm giving it away. I want nothing by the time I go. I don't want no house, I don't want no car, nothing. The less I have on earth, the more I'm going to have in heaven. For every dime I put in that box, I believe God gives me a $10 bill up in heaven and I want some heavenly stash. My wife needs to be spoiled at some point in time in her life. I don't want nothing. God's blessed me here on earth. Bless me, but I want nothing left like these people, like these Hall of Faith people. They were wealthy, they were rich, they had everything, and they left it, and they walked it, and they said, this is not my home. Heard my pastor, Pastor Bob used to always say, you go to heaven, and you're going to look on the mountain, or the block you live on, oh, look at that mansion, that must be Billy Graham. No. Well, is it Bob Coy? No. Who is it? Henrietta Jones. Who the heck is Henrietta Jones? Just a woman who sat in back of the church every single week and prayed for everybody in that church every single week. She gave away what she had, and she got no glory on earth. So she got all her glory and all her heavenly stash in heaven. 
faith. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises, offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. The same Abraham who had faith enough to believe at 100 years old, not only could he have this thing with his wife happen, but he could also get her pregnant. Not only that, when the baby came, God said, I want you to give me back the kid. I want you to bring him up on a mountain and sacrifice him. You guys might not know this story. It's in the book of Genesis. So he brings his 14-year-old son up on a mountain. He takes a knife in his hand. And he says, I believe, according to this, what we're reading, that even if I sacrifice him to God, God's able to raise him up from the dead. So God, if this is what you're asking me to do, and I'm sure this is what your voice said, okay. And he raises his hand. Now, I don't know what the 14 year old kid was thinking, like, uh, you're sure, Dad? Don't worry. And as soon as he went to plunge that knife in, Angel grabbed his hand and said, No. And the voice of God came to him and said, Now I know you are truly faith filled, for you wouldn't even withhold your son, your only begotten son, from me. Now, Abraham didn't withhold his only begotten son from God. So God did not withhold his only begotten son from us. Let me tell you, you guys have heard this story too. Me and my wife have loved our children so much, almost to a fault, almost too much. We find ourselves holding our kids, protecting them from so much. Don't do that, don't touch this, don't do that, don't do this, don't touch that, don't do that, don't touch this, don't do that. Wear this, put your, put your thing up, put your thing up. Don't do jujitsu, don't do wrestling, don't do this, don't do nothing. Don't do crying, don't do. Why? Fear. Fear. Can't let him do anything. I just love him so much. I can't leave, I can't even go to work. Give him up. God's taking care of them. Here's a crazy thing, guys. God loves your kids even more than you do. You know that? You got a wayward son, a wayward daughter? Give them up to God. Pray. Oh, if that's all I got to do is pray. I, that's all I can do. Don't you understand that's the first thing you should have been doing? The faith that it takes to pray is greater and mightier than anything you can do with your mouth or hands. All right. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshiped them, leaning on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of his departure from, to the children of Israel and gave instructions concerning his bones. Now, I can go through all these little details with you and explain to you how this worked out and how this was certain words of prophecy and faithful things, but here's what I'm going to tell you this. What if I told you that you could save your kids from every painful, foul thing that can ever happen in their lives by praying for them every single day. Would you believe me? I bet the majority you would believe me. I bet the majority said, yeah, absolutely. I do believe in faith. I do. Well, I want to ask you then, how come we don't pray for our kids every single day? Are we too busy? Are we too distracted? Are we too Why? If you believe that in faith, Pray for them every single day. Every day. Don't let another day go by without praying for your kids. Grab them. Lay your hands on their head. My son, I've prayed for him every single day since he was conceived. I watched him grow in my wife's belly. And I used to talk to him through my wife's belly. I used to say, Josiah, do you hear me? What do you mean, Josiah? He was named before he was conceived. The Lord gave me a dream while I was in prison that I was going to have a baby and name him Josiah. And he was going to be the child of promise, the Nazarite. 
By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. You in a job? And it's hard to maintain a witness. It's hard to even know what a witness is. Because the guys that are doing the wrong thing, they're getting rewarded. The guys that are doing the right thing, they ain't getting nothing. It's the way the world works. You do the wrong thing, there's the reward. Money, power, relationships. Do the wrong thing, you're broke and alone. Moses knew. Moses is your father of the faithful. Each one of these names that I'm reading to you, these are people you could hold on to. You should be looking up later on. You ladies here that have been trying to conceive one way or the other, you should be looking. What kind of woman was this woman? Sarah. Moses. Abraham. Noah. Enoch. Who are these people? What have they done? What did they do that... I can learn from, that I can emulate, that I can bless my life. Or maybe you're just cool. Listen, I'm fine. Leave me alone already, man. Turn it off, dude. Maybe you came to the wrong place today. Maybe you don't need nothing. Maybe I'm the only one whose life is totally screwed up. That's why I started going to church. Maybe. By faith, Moses forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. My adult daughters have endured college. 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, they brought home pornography, worldliness, homosexuality. They have been hit on, hit upon. They have been looked at, stared down, talked down, abused, misused, poorly graded because of their faith in God. They use my daughter Arlie now as a mocking board. Let's see what Arlie has to say. What was the last one, R? Huh? What was it? Abortion? No, it was the last one that you just told about the other day. A what? A vegan. Showed him a movie and everything. There's a creative writing course, and they're showing videos of some wicked crap that has absolutely nothing to do with creative writing. Elena one time brought home a, a book that a professor told her to read. And it described how one guy gave another guy, you know what I mean. And I called up the school, I said, how could you give my 18-year-old daughter this pornography to read? I'm sorry, who are you? I'm Elena Gitman's father. We don't talk to parents. Excuse me? And hey, listen, if you want to send your daughter to a private school, there's plenty of good Christian private schools you could send her. We don't, click. It's like, you, yeah. It's an Italian word. <laughs> Means, I'm a gonna kill you. <laughs> you better strengthen their faith, because let me tell you something, this world will eat them up in that college, and that crap they're teaching them there, it will take your wonderful Christian faith-filled kids turn them into vegans. <laughs> she started talking about the movie. I, I'm packing her bags. I went in the room and started packing her bags. You're getting out of my house with that vegan stuff. Well, at least free range. I don't need no free range. Listen, no free range here. Lots of meat, lots of good stuff here. Lots of chemicals, <laughs> steroids. Got to get big, you know what I mean? <laughs> oh. 
By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, verse 29 says, where the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. By faith the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe and when she received the spies with peace. I love this. Right in the middle of all these great people of faith is a prostitute. And it brings me hope because truly I was a spiritual prostitute, believing in everything as a young lad growing up in a very liberal home, father Catholic, mother Jewish, really didn't do nothing. But Rahab, a prostitute, here listed in the hall of faith because she believed in God. I don't know where you come from. I don't know if, if you're like me and maybe you have a background and you've done such horrible things in your life. God, he's in the business of redeeming horrible. Our, our pre Protestant churches have kind of made it so that you have to go to college to be this and college to do that and pass cemetery, I mean seminary school and all this other stuff. Listen, I, I have I appreciation for all that stuff, but my God is in the redemption of saving sinners of whom I'm chief. Amen. Foul and filthy beast, God came and filled me up with his Holy Spirit, led and guide me. And you know what happened when I became a Christian? I didn't become like some automatic Republican. I didn't become some automatic pro-life person. I didn't, I didn't become something that the whole world thinks of Christianity. I just believed in Jesus. I just started reading scripture and, and people that were around me, some of them so good, they just let God do the work. You know, you have to vote Republican now, now you gotta don't believe in this and believe in that and oh, you have to have all the things now. You're a denomination now, you know, I'm like, just love Jesus. Just believe. Like the harlot Rahab. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became vigilant in battle, valiant in battle, turned flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead raised to life again. Please give me your attention. You've prayed for how long and God didn't answer your prayer. You had faith. You believed. You forced it. You felt it so much so. And it didn't work out the way you thought. God let you down. You thought you could be set free if you just believed. I want to stop doing these drugs. I want to stop sleeping around. I want to, but I... I made promises to God, and he promises me, but he, I can't stop. Look at the latter half of th verse 35. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trials of mockings and scourgings. Yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. Hallelujah. So if God doesn't answer your prayer, you have a greater reward than if God does answer your prayer. The world's not worthy of the promises that God has offered you, but that does not mean you won't receive the promises. Wow. This is a little trippy for me. Wait a second. So if I hope in something and I don't receive it, I'm more blessed than if I do receive it. So if I have faith to believe that God's going to do something and God does it, I'm blessed. But if I have faith to believe that God does something but he doesn't do it, then I'm more blessed. This is so weird. Yeah, you're in church listening to a convicted felon teach the Bible. You're weird to begin with. <laughs> and let me just let you in a little secret, guys. Something that my brothers that are part of the 
armed services understand. Do you know that the last 100 years, more people have died than in the 1900 previous for their belief in Christ? You live in what's called the American bubble. And your faith, <laughs> so weak. Our faith, should I say, is so weak. I want you to know in Christ's day, Julius Caesar used to wrap Christians in sheep's, he used to cut sheep open, take out the guts, wrap them in their skin, and throw them, Nero Caesar, used to throw them in his, what was that thing called? The Colosseum. And, and, and everybody used to cheer as the lions would eat them. That really happened, guys. And you know what the Lord Jesus said? Worse is coming for you. You believe you're going to get raptured before that? I certainly hope I am. Because I don't know if my faith can handle that. You deny him, you live. You don't deny him, you die. Something like that. I get confused. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. All these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. That they should not be made perfect apart from us. That the promises that you will receive in the presence of the people of heaven will be greater than the promises that you will receive here on earth. This is crazy, man. Faith is a weird thing. Faith is a very weird thing. I have in my hand here a list of cards of people who in faith wanted to be prayed over. And I don't know which one God's going to answer miraculously, because like it's been said, you never know when you're a one prayer away from a miracle. I don't know if, a, you know, I've prayed for people and they've died. I've prayed for people and they've gotten worse. I've, I don't know what God's going to do. I know the Bible says this, that the, the prayer, that the effectual fervent prayer, the fervent prayer, you know what I mean, the fervent prayer, the fervent effectual prayer of a righteous man. You know why I mess that up? Because I've read that in so many different versions that now I have all the versions that mess up. The fervent effectual prayer of a righteous man is powerful and availeth much. You believe that? I'm not really righteous by anything I've done, but I believe that 1 John 1, 9 says that if I confess my sins, I'm righteous because of him. So... Since I'm surrounded by a bunch of righteous folk who don't deserve to be called righteous except through the power of God's blood, I want to pray in faith for these people.